This is our third video on power law networks. Today we will talk about the self-similar and fractal-like nature of these massive networks. Researchers have observed that most real-world networks have a power law exponent that is between 2 and 3. In the previous video, we made some observations about the network structure that is enforced by these values of alpha. The first moment, or average degree, is near zero, so the vast majority of vertices have small degree. But the second moment, or degree variance, is extremely large, and this means there is a small but significant collection of hub nodes with massive degrees. These hub nodes characterize the global structure of the network. When we look at one of these power law networks, it has an array of hubs of different sizes. And this reminds us of a fractal. If we zoom in on a smaller part of the network, it looks like a miniature copy of the original network. This is what we mean when we talk about a scale-free network. We will now show that any network that has this self-similar property must actually be a power law network. We will take a step back and we'll talk about scale-free distributions rather than talking about scale-free networks. Now, loosely speaking, a scale-free distribution is one that looks the same under every scaling. And here's an example using city populations. Suppose that we know that cities containing 30,000 people are one-fourth as common as cities with 15,000 people. In a scale-free distribution, this would mean that cities of size 200,000 must be one-quarter as likely as cities of size 100,000 and that cities with 20 million people must be a quarter as likely as cities with 10 million people. In general, for any positive integer x, the frequency of a city population of size 2x must be one quarter as likely as a city with population x. This definition has the self-similar ethos of a fractal. No matter how far we zoom in or out, we see the same basic curve shape in our viewing window. Here's the official definition of a scale-free distribution. The distribution P is scale-free when there exists a function G, such that for any positive number B, we have P of B times X is equal to G of B times P of X. The constant b is our dilation factor. When b is less than 1, we are zooming in. When b is greater than 1, we are zooming out. What this definition is saying is that the zoom factor is what matters, not the particular location x. That is, we have some multiplication factor on the probability that only depends upon the dilation factor b and is independent of position x. Going back to our city example, we would know that this dilation function g satisfies g of 2 is equal to 1 quarter. That is, if we double the size of the city, then the probability goes down by a factor of 4. The curve between 1 and 1 1.5 is supposed to be self-similar to the curve between 2 and 3. That corresponds to taking b is equal to 2. But they are clearly different. The first is much steeper than the second. And the curve between 1 and 1 1.5 is also supposed to be similar to the curve between 4 and 6, which corresponds to using b equal to 4. And the same goes for the curve between 8 and 12. That's just b equals 8. In fact, all of these are supposed to be self-similar to one another. So, how do we make sense of this? The key is that the self-similarity corresponds to different dilations of the x-axis and the y-axis. The x-axis undergoes an expansion. When b is equal to 2, the width of the interval doubles. But the height undergoes contraction, not expansion. Remember in our city example, when the city size became twice as big, the probability became four times smaller. This is what it would look like if both the width and the height expanded. But that's not what we want. We actually have to contract the heights. So we undo the height expansions here, and we end up at our final curve. In summary, we can see the self-similarity, but we have to remember that we use different dilations for the width and for the height. We are now ready to prove the equivalence of being a power law and being scale-free. And here is our main result. This theorem says two things. First, any power law distribution has the scale-free property, and second, any distribution with the scale-free property must be a power law. 
We will prove this equivalence over the next few slides. So let's start by proving that a power law distribution is scale-free. We can actually finish this proof on a single slide. We assume that p of x is equal to c times x to the negative alpha. And we must find the dilation function g of b so that p times b of x is equal to g of b times p of x. Using the formula for a power law, we find that p of b times x is equal to 1 over b to the alpha times p of x. So if we define g of b to be 1 over b to the alpha, we are actually done. When we expand the x-axis by a factor of b, we need to contract the y-axis by a factor of b to the alpha. That is our scale-free recipe. Now let's tackle the other direction, and this takes a little longer. We assume that our distribution p has the scale-free property, and we have to show that p is in fact a power law. We start by taking x equal to 1, and this gives us the value of g of b. It is just p of b divided by p of 1. So now we can write our scale-free equation as p of b times x is equal to p of b divided by p of 1 multiplied by p of x. We've gotten rid of the function g, and that's progress. Now let's differentiate with respect to b. This may seem a little weird to you since we usually think of b as a constant, but it's just a variable, and I can treat p of b times x as a multivariable function. So let's do it. On the left-hand side, we are just using the chain rule. The right-hand side is even easier. We are just taking a straight derivative. This is because the other two terms are constant with respect to b. Next, let's set b equals 1, and we get this equation, and we'll use this to solve for the function p of x. When we solve for the function p of x, it will actually be easier if we rename it using a variable, so let's call it y for now. So let's rewrite this equation using y instead of p of x. We get a differential equation. We have x times the derivative of y is equal to a constant times y, and the value of that constant is shown here. What's great is that this is a separable differential equation. So let's put the y's on the left side and the x's on the right side. Next we integrate both sides, and what comes out is a linear relationship between log y and log of x. We exponentiate both sides, and voila, we have our power law. All that's left to do is fill in the proper values for the constants c and d. And we already know that c is equal to p prime of 1 divided by p of 1. To express this as a power law, we just take alpha to be negative c. And finally, we can quickly find d by plugging in x is equal to 1 we find that d is actually equal to p of 1, and so our final formula is p of x is equal to p of 1 times x to the minus alpha, where alpha is equal to negative p prime of 1 divided by p of 1. And so we have shown that if a distribution is scale-free, then it must be a power law. To wrap things up, here is what we know about power law networks. The natural power law exponent range is between 2 and 3. This leads to the existence of a small but influential collection of hub nodes that determine the macro structure of the network. Furthermore, this structure has a fractal quality. This self-similarity is called the scale-free property. In this video, we showed that a network is scale-free if and only if it is a power law network. And once again, I want to remind you that power law networks are an idealized model. The reality is much more complicated and we do not expect real-world networks to be perfect power laws. However, knowing and recognizing the hallmarks of an idealized power law will help us to get an overall sense of the network, and perhaps help us to notice structures that are unique to a particular empirical network.